Okay. Um, hello, I'm Jez. This is. Look, you can see it's the same. Um, I've not been in this room before. It's quite high up, and there's a power dynamic here that I'm not entirely comfortable with, and I'm worried I'm going to fall off the edge. But um, that might, you know, that might be good actually, mightn't it? It'll bring me down to the. So anyway, um, I am one of the older, well, perhaps not in this room, older, beardier programming contingent, um, which I do feel slightly guilty about, but not guilty enough to not stand up here and talk. Um, so th thank you all for coming. Um, this is the ninth time I've spoken at the ACU conference. And you know the way it works is you, you think about something you want to talk about, and then you write a proposal, and you send it in. And if the committee like it, then you get on the program, and you get to stand up here and talk. And um, this year, well, some years I've, I've thought about what I'm going to talk about quite a lot, and some years I haven't thought very much. One year, I didn't. I wrote a proposal in. I think 35 minutes, there was 35 minutes less to go, and I got it in with 28 seconds before the cutoff. Is someone else hearing me, Jim? <laughs> so this year, I thought, well, I've got a topic, and I thought about it really, really hard before I, before I submitted it, because did I want my name on the internet in proximity to the words blockchain and cryptocurrency? <laughs> And I thought about that for a bit, and I thought, well, look, older, whiter, beardier, I've got to pass, right? I just, I can, so this is me exercising my privilege. Um, now, sorry, I'm going to try not to tap that again. Perhaps in, in software, perhaps even more so than in society in general, we are absolute fools for fashion, right, and for hype. And new things come along and we get all very excited about them. You know, we all went to bed one evening, and the next day, Mongo was really fashionable, and we were all using, like, NoSQL databases for everything, right? And then that, that faded away. That particular one faded away, except for you, Don. I know. Um, but other things, you know, other things, they snowball. They grow quite gradually. Python, for example, has been growing for, like, 20 years now, right? To the point where it's respectable. Or functional programming. 60 years, and now we're all doing it. Okay, and, and, and blockchains and cryptocurrencies seem to be one of those kind of snowballing hype things. So Bitcoin was founded about 10 years ago, and it seems that over the last kind of two or three years, it's constantly, you get seeing references to it more and more often. You know, Bitcoin this or blockchain that. And you see it not just in the technology press, what we might call technology press, but in kind of mainstream press as well, you see it in there. Do papers still exist, newspapers? You see it on newspaper websites, right? And you see it on, on the news and things. So, like it's built into some kind of unignorable force. Um, but hopefully, at the end of this session, you'll all be happily able to ignore it. Um, I got a couple of people to look over the proposal uh, before I submitted it. And um, they were generally positive, but uh, one of the comments I got was, I wouldn't give any of my talks such a clickbaity title. And, <laughs> which I suppose is true. But you know what they, they, when you're doing a presentation, the, kind of, the classic advice is, tell people what you're going to tell them, tell them, tell them again. So this is a bit where I'm going to tell you, um, because I'm not going to tell you that cryptocurrency is the future of money, or if you hold it long enough, you'll be driving a Lambo to the moon or any of that stuff or how it's going to revolutionize anything. I'm going to tell you what they are, what blockchains are, and then I'm going to tell you why they're terrible. OK? Because that's in the title. I'm going to tell you what they are, ignore my own slides, why they're terrible. So if now you think I'm in the wrong talk, and Jonathan Bukhara's talk on legacy code sounds really good, I think it's that way, or the one about asynchronous ranges sounds really good, because they do sound really good, it's OK to go. In fact, if you all went, then I could go to one of them as well. That would be brilliant. Um, so, so let's start with blockchains. And often, when we describe a piece of technology, we have at least some problem in mind. We say, here's a problem, and this leads through whichever chain of whatever sort of system of logic I'm going to give you, this leads to some solution, and the solution matches the problem. And for cryptocurrencies, 
particularly, it's actually quite hard to know what the problem is. Um, it's not really very well articulated. The original uh, Bitcoin white paper that you see referred to a lot doesn't really articulate the problem. Uh, not in any... I'll come, I'll come back to this, but it doesn't really articulate a problem. Um, and so, and some people will tell you that one day we'll all be using Bitcoin for everything. You'll buy your coffee in the morning with Bitcoin, and you go to Tesco's and you'll pay it with Bitcoin. And, uh, and then some people say, no, actually, they, actually, Bitcoins are a store of value. We will be investing in Bitcoin and it will retain its value and then we'll all get rich. And some other people will tell you that it's um, about banking the unbanked and that people who don't have access to conventional financial services uh, will somehow be enabled to join the, the modern digital economy or some other kind of white saviour bullshit. Um, but all these people are using the same software. So if we look at how the software is put together, we can understand that, and then maybe we can try and reverse engineer some problems from, from that. So they all agree that this is what a blockchain looks like. We've got some data that's organized into a block, and the blocks are organized in a chain. This is a clue. The clue is in the name. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so, yeah, we organize this data into a block, and we put it into this chain, and once it's in there, then it's, it's fixed. I can't take block N and put it over here, and I can't take any of my data and shuffle that around. It's, it's fixed in place. Um, and this data, in the, in the language of blockchain, these are transactions. And they're transactions both in a kind of database sense, in that they're an, an atomic action that either happens or doesn't happen at all. And because we're talking about alleged currencies, sorry, I'll try not to be too snarky in the early part. Because we're talking about currencies, <laughs> They're transactions in that I am person A is paying person B some money. Um, so a block contains a lot of transactions. Uh, the timestamp when it's created, it knows which block it is, so it knows which the previous one is. And then the block that comes after knows which one it's joining on to. And new blocks kind of appear every so often up here, stretching off into the future. And if we go all the way back, Right at the beginning, there'll be the genesis block, which is some kind of like magical starting block that's kind of conjured out of, out of nowhere, out of maths, that everything else then joins onto. Um, so and this is the kind of the general shape for all blockchains and all cryptocurrencies. There are things, there are particular cryptocurrencies, particular blockchain implementations that vary in the details but they're all largely of this form. If I could see some of you, I'd hope to see somebody nodding there. Could you nod for me, Paul? Thank you. Um, so, that one. So, once we've gathered up our data into the block, the block is closed. We can't add anything more to it. We can't change it. The only way we can add additional data is through this block on the end here. So, blockchains are append only. You can only add data in on on the end there. And we can see pretty naturally why this, why this is. They also guarantee the provenance of the data within them. These aren't just little messages saying, Alice is sending Bob 10 magic coins. They are cryptographically signed messages saying, Alice is sending Bob uh, 10 whatever. So your user account on a blockchain, uh, commonly referred to as your address or your wallet, is actually uh, the public part. You, you, when you create an account, account is not even the right word, is it? when you generate your address, you're actually generating a key pair. And your, uh, the address is the public part, of, it's the public half of that pair. And when you, send, when you submit your transactions onto the chain, you sign those transactions with your key pair. So, consequently, we know who, or at least which address, 
created each one of these transactions. And we could, if we wanted, scan the whole history to find out everything that they'd ever done. And we could also track every single one of our internet coins through this mechanism, if you were so minded. So they guarantee the provenance of that data. That's a crypto part of the cryptocurrency, that these things are cryptographically signed. They run as cryptocurrencies, blockchains, they run as peer-to-peer -peer networks. And for each node in the network to function, it has to have a copy of the data. So it has to have all these blocks. And we'll get to why they need them in, in just a moment. But they need to have a copy of all these blocks, or at least most of them. And so blockchains are distributed databases. They're very poor databases in terms of data throughput. Their read speed is not good, and their write speed is abysmal, but they are really quite distributed. Okay, So they're distributed databases, and they do all this. They give us an append-only, append guaranteed provenance, distributed database with no central authority. There's, no, there's nothing in the middle of the network going, that's a good piece of data, that's a bad piece of data, we like that one, we don't like that one, put these in this order. It arises out of the network itself. And quite why that is the case, you can't easily discern from this particular diagram. So trust me on this. We'll come back to that in a moment. So <clears throat> let's put that together. Let's, let's actually build this up. Let's start with this classical data structure. This is a specifically a singly linked list. Lovely. So I'm going to fall off here. So we start at the head, and we have some data, and we have a pointer to the next block, and that's some data, and a pointer, and so on and so on, until we get to the end, which looks kind of similar to what we just had. Um, but if we, so instead of pointing that way, what if we, we point them the other way? And the tail points back towards the head. Well, that's the same, right? Now, normally when we talk about a linked list, we're talking about things in, in memory. So I've got my chunk of data, and then I've got a little thing that says, go to this place in memory to find the next one. And that goes, look at that place in memory. Now, for our blockchain, for our cryptocurrency, that, we don't have them in memory. We're just getting data from like internet randos. It could be, it could be anything. So we use a, a thing, a, a thing called a, a hash pointer. What a hash pointer is, is a data structure that says, this is where you find the data, and this is its signature. This is, we've hashed the data, we've generated a cryptographic hash of that. So when you get this data, it looks like this. It has this signature. So <clears throat> what we say is, in, a, in my blockchain case, I'm here, I know, and I say, I know the block before me is block 742, and its hash, the hash of the contents of that block, is something. And this is, this is where the, the immutability of it, the append-only nature, comes from. Because let's say I, I fire up my node and I say, give me some blocks. Give me some of that sweet cryptocurrency data. And a block comes in, and it contains within it a pointer to the previous block. And that block arrives. Then I can run my cryptographic hash function on that, hash, 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 and I get a value. And if the value I was given is, matches the value I calculate, then I know this is the true piece of data, and then I can follow that chain back, because that will have the hash of the previous one, and so on, and so on, and so on. And in fact, then the whole kind of, because each one includes the hash of the previous one, the whole thing is secured through this chain of hashes. Does that make sense? Am I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm explaining that very clearly, but does that make sense? So there we are. We have our lovely chain of, of hashes, each pointing to the previous one, and kind of each is, like, in a sense, like the commutative hash of all of the previous ones, because each one can have the hash of the previous one. And then there's lots of space in there for my data to rattle around in. Look, lots of space. Um, now, our data is a set of transactions. Um, Alice pays Bob, Bob pays Charlie, and so on. And whether we think about that as a monetary transaction or as a database transaction, the, the order of these transactions is important. 
right? But how you apply them, the order in which they occur is important. And we could use another list, but as you probably see, you probably picked up from the earlier slide, we use a tree. So here's a lovely tree. This is binary tree, two for two. Great. That's all the computer science you're getting. That's it. And of course, like all, all computer science trees, it grows down from the root. And we start the root node. You know how this works. Start the root node, you've got a pointer to each side, and then each side has another two more pointers. And eventually, you get to the leaves where the data lives. And in the same way as we apply these hash pointers to our list, we apply them to the hash to the, to the tree as well. So we have some data at the bottom, which we arrange into pairs, and we calculate the hash of, of each of those data, chunks of data, and then we put those hashes into pairs, and we calculate the hash of each hash pair, so the top there, and we continue up, oh sorry, three bits of computer science, we recurse, we do it again, until we get right to the top. And so the whole of the tree is constructed of these hash pointers. And so, again, if I'm presented with a piece of data, I'm presented with one of these uh, sets of transactions, and it turns out one of these has been, is not right, then that chain of hashes will, will break down. Um, this, is, this is a Merkle tree, uh, which is invented by a chap called Ralph Merkle, who's uh, quite a big noise in cryptography. If you go to Andy and CB's session on Git, after this, they will probably talk about Merkle trees quite a lot there as well. Um, so this chap, Merkle, he, uh, like I say, quite a big noise in cryptography. Um, any of our older audience members have an Atari 2600 and play River Raid? No. Yes? Well, the woman that he married, that'll be his wife, she wrote River Raid, which I think is probably, a, you know, culturally more, more significant. Anyway. Um, so this chap Merkel, he works in cryptography. Now, because he's Californian, he works with Ray Kurzweil on the singularity and cryonics and all that nonsense. So anyway, we've got this Merkel tree. Um, and it has it, so it's a tamper-proof tree. And it also uh, gives, us, it's a, gives us a nice um, proof of membership. So if I say, I have a transaction, and it has this hash, and the chain of hashes up to the root of the tree, you can quite easily determine whether it's actually a member of this tree, which is useful when I'm, uh, we'll see later on, if I have a transaction which refers to one in, the, in a previous block, you can quite easily find, very quickly find, if that thing actually exists. So, we've got a hash powered pointers securing my blocks going this way, and we've got our hash-powered Merkle trees, hash-secured Merkle trees, containing the data uh, going that way. But this doesn't tell us anything about how the data got there in the first place. So, or, or how those blocks are created. So, here we go. I'm out in a town. I always walk like this when I'm out in a town. I'm going into a coffee shop to buy a fancy coffee with my cryptocurrency client under my arm. This is, this is a real place. Um, it's called Bitcoin Coffee, and you have to go all the way to Prague for a cup of their coffee. It's apparently very good. You can only pay in Bitcoin. Um, so anyway, I go there, and I order my coffee, and I, I whip out my Bitcoin client and uh, laboriously type in the lengthy string of hex digits the barista gives me, or maybe if he's quite modern, I scan a QR code. Bloop. And I press send, and then what happens? What happens now? So we've got our peer-to-peer -peer network, and we've got all our nodes that are talking to each other. And they're not, not all, you know, not every node is going to be talking to every other node. We've got this loose kind of mesh of nodes. Um, back when BitTorrent was, was fashionable, you had this idea, you know, you had some pirated film over here, and somebody over there wanted it, and the data would flow kind of... A, that way. So you, it was as a distribution mechanism. Here, we're actually using it to store data. 
So everybody who's interacting with my cryptocurrency is doing so through one of these <coughs> nodes. Every actual person. So I'm paying for my coffee, and here comes my transaction. And I'm talking to my, my node, wherever that is. Maybe on my phone, if I've got an exceptionally, a phone with an exceptionally large battery. So I inject my uh, transaction here. And uh, that node says, OK, I'll add that to my little list of pending transactions. And then it starts to, to, talk, to its, talk to its peers. And it says, hey, I've got this, this new transaction. And they go, OK, great. We'll add that to our little list. Uh, and gradually, of course, then this will spread across the network. But I'm not the only person buying a fancy coffee. Somebody in California is, is buying one as well, unlikely as that seems. And their transaction is coming in somewhere else in the network. And that transaction is, is propagating through the network as well. So that's spreading out through its friends there. Oops, oops, oops. And so at any given time, all the nodes in the network have a slightly different view of what's going on. They might have a different list of, of pending transactions. They might have received the transactions in a different order. Then some of these nodes might have dropped out of the network. A new node might have come in. So this is, this is kind of a normal situation. And so they're all building up these lists of transactions. And suddenly, one of them goes, bing, I've got it. I've got a new block. I am the winner. I have a new block. And it incorporates, it's built this block for itself. We'll see how it does that in just a moment. It does that block for itself. And that block, then it starts to tell its friends, I've got a new block. Lads, I've got a new block. Lads, lads, lads. lads. And that block starts to propagate through the network. But another node could also have generated a new block. Maybe my node down here. And that node, sorry, that block, is going to be propagating across the network as well. So we've got these competing latest blocks in flight. How do, we, how do we resolve that? This is normal. This is the normal situation. How does, I don't know, this guy know which is the, the true position? Here he is. He's working away, doing whatever he does, waiting either trying to create or waiting for a new block to arrive. And his peer says, got that new block you're looking for? And there you go. And he goes, oh, great. I'll, I'll pop that there. And then another peer, or oh, oh, actually come through the same route. I don't know. Another one arrives and says, look, I've, I've got a new block. And they're both claiming to be block n plus 1. They've got different timestamps. They've got different data. They've both got the same hash pointer. So they're both pointing back to the same origin point, but they are different in the details. So now, how do I, how do I decide which is the true one? Well, you don't. Eventually, someone's going to say, have you heard about that new block M plus 2? And that will have a hash pointer to one or other of these. And so now it's starting to look like this is the, the true pattern. This is the true, the true chain. And again, all these could be different. There could be transactions in there that actually end up in here. It doesn't matter. I'm interested in this, in this chain of hash pointers through here. And over time, I'll get another block come in here. I might get another n plus 2. I'll get an n plus 3. I am plus four. If my node that's working away generates a new block, it's going to tag it onto the longest chain that it currently knows about. And gradually, as we go ahead in time until I fall off the end here, the, the, the longest chain will emerge. So there's always going to be churn. Hang on, which way am I going? In time. There's always going to be churn at the kind of the head of the chain. But as, as this extends out, some of those little side shoots are going to wither away because nobody's adding new blocks to that. So this is my longest one. And then eventually this one will be the longest one. And so these sort of side sprouts wither away. And the, 
the longest chain emerges. And nobody has to decide. There's no central authority deciding what that longest chain is. You just observe it through the blocks that you receive. And so there's like, so there's like, it's almost like, uh, a, you know, like Doctor Who, as well. they see the possible futures. And you're constantly seeing those possible futures, but one emerges. And that's, that's your blockchain. That's the one you, you believe. So one of the consequences of this is that there's no guarantee that any particular transaction will end up in a particular block or even be incorporated into the chain at all. You know, if I had some stuff that was incorporated in there and that never gets into the chain and it isn't picked up by another node and, and, sealed, into a, and, and sealed into a block, it might, might never get in there at all. So this is how we extend the chain, um, but we haven't talked about how, how we actually decide that we've created a new block. Yes? Trying to force particular transactions into particular blocks. Force, uh, by, yeah, by trying to force new blocks onto the chain. Yes, it can, but it, that needs that happens. That can happen in a particular circumstance, which I will come to later on. But yes. So here's our in-process block that all my my nodes on the network are working away at. And it's got some data in it, and that data is composed of the transactions that I've seen. And when I get a new transaction in, I maybe have to, have to rebalance my tree and recalculate my hashes. But how do I know when I've actually created a new block? It's because there's something else in that block that I haven't shown you that yet. It's a magical random number. This is, this is the key on which it, or this is the thing on which it all rests. So when we're calculating the hashes of things, we calculate the hash of our Merkle tree of data, we calculate the hash then of the block itself, and what we're trying to do is create a block that has a hash with a particular characteristic. So it might be, you know, if you've got a 64-digit hash value, it might have to be below a particular value, or it might need to have a certain number of leading zeros, or something. So I'm trying to generate a particular... So you've got the, hu or the, like the whole hash space, and I'm trying to hit just a little part of it. And I might be able to do that just by rearranging the transactions. But, you know, the point about hashes is that they're hard to predict, right? In fact, really hard. <laughs> really hard to predict. So instead of constantly jiggling around my transactions, what I do is I just add a random seed and see what happens. I've got this data, I'm ready to go. Does that the right hash value? No. Pick another number. Go. Pick another number. Go. Pick another number. Go. Pick another number. And that's what Bitcoin miners are doing all the time. They are picking random numbers and trying to see if the hash comes out right. And if the hash comes out and has the right the particular characteristics, that's a block. You send it out onto your network. And because hash values, hash values are easy to verify, I go, look, lads, I've got this data and this magic number. It's a work of a moment to confirm the hash, so they're easy to verify, but hard, hard, hard to calculate, hard in the sense that you don't know what the right inputs are to get the output that you want. So they're spinning away, picking these random numbers, like join a lottery all the time. And when you get the right combination of seed value, of nonce, that's the cryptographic term, with your data, then you've created a block. And you send it out onto the network, and maybe then somebody else will build another block that attaches onto that, incorporates that, ha that your hash into its hash pointer, and so on and so on. And maybe your block will then be incorporated into the chain. So you have to spin through a lot of these numbers, which is why people endanger their health building crazy rigs like this. I think this was... This might actually be somebody's basement bedroom, I think. And he was getting, couldn't sleep because it was so noisy and hot. I think because he's got all his 
GPUs working away there. But why would you do that? Why would you generate all these numbers to try and seal these blocks? Um, and you might imagine that if I was able to spin through a whole load of numbers really quickly and generate the blocks really quickly, then the blocks would start, like, just, they start firing out, right? If I can spin through them, yeah? So if I can spin through numbers quickly to find the right kind of hash, I'm going to generate the block more quickly. But actually, that's not the case. Because uh, Bitcoin and the other, uh, the other cryptocurrencies have a mechanism to rebalance the difficulty. So if you get a lot of new nodes and lots of people guessing these numbers, then periodically, they adjust the difficulty. They reduce that portion of the hash space that you're trying to hit. So if you get, like, so, you know, if there were, like, two of you, it would be quite a big area. But if you've got 97,000 Chinese headmasters with secret mining rigs in their basements, that's going to shrink down to a smaller target area that you're looking for. So you adjust the difficulty to maintain the block frequency as best you can. You want the blocks to be regular, so you adjust the difficulty of that hash puzzle that you're trying to trying to hit. Um, so, yeah, for Bitcoin, it turns out that the hash function they use is very amenable to vectorization, which is why you have that GPU bubble, although now people are using custom ASICs for that kind of thing. Other cryptocurrencies designed hash functions which were vectorization resistant, but it's, you know, it'll, basically you throw compute power at it. But why? Why would I spend all that money on GPU cards and electricity and things? Well, because these are currencies. And so you get paid for creating new blocks. Now, of course, right? So you, you get paid with the block reward. So people who create new blocks can add their own little trans, the last little transaction in there that says, I created this block, I get the block reward. So you get paid for creating the block. Um, in, for Bitcoin, the original block reward was 50 Bitcoins, and that tails away every 210,000 blocks, which is some period of years, I forget. And it's now down at 12 and a half Bitcoins. The idea that as there are more in circulation, you need to reward people less for some reason, maths. And gradually, that'll tail down to nothing when all the Bitcoins have been issued and somehow the system will still be working. Other cryptocurrencies have similar schemes. So you get rewarded for creating the block. You also get transaction fees. So when I'm writing my little transaction, Alice is giving Bob 10, whatever, you can add a little bit on the end that says, and take something for yourself. And if you create that block, and that block gets incorporated into the chain, you get the block reward and the, the transaction fees attached to the transactions in that block. Which is why, if you would send a transaction, stop paying attention, if you would send a transaction and you said, I don't want to pay a fee, your transaction might never get incorporated because it might not be economically worthwhile for me to add it in, whereas Dom over here says, so I'm going to give you a big fat fee, I'm going to write, I'm going to put that in my tree and then restart calculating my magic numbers. Because every time I change that, my Merkle tree, I've got to start with my hash numbers all over again, right? So we incentivize people. That's how we make people work hard in the modern age. We incentivize them. We incentivize them with a block reward and with transaction fees. I think the, the idea is eventually the block reward falls to nothing because the transaction fees will cover the expense. I think that's the, that's the theory. So that's, that's pretty much it from the technology point of view. We have our hash pointer secured chain. We have our hash pointer secured tree of data. So we have this tamper proof, these tamper proof data structures. We have uh, cryptographically signed, the transactions are cryptographically signed. So we know, I was going to say we know they're legitimate, and that's the wrong word in this context. <laughs> we know something about where they're coming from. We can be sure of the origin, in some sense, of each one. And through that consensus mechanism, through that just seeing which of the, where the chain leads itself, we get a, a consensus view of the, of the state of the system. 
in the absence of anyone actually picking it for us. Um, so I've referred pretty much exclusively so far to Bitcoin. There it is, its lovely logo. Um, because that was the first cryptocurrency, so it's the kind of one that set the, the template that the others have, have riffed off. Um, there are now... Sorry? There are now, a, who knows how many cryptocurrencies? A bazillion, at least 2,000 listed on public exchanges. Um, because creating a new one is really easy, right? Because in order for this to work, the code has to be, the data structures are open, the code has to be open, the algorithms have to be open. So if you want to create your own cryptocurrency, you can just take one of the ones that already exists and tweak a parameter, and then you've got it. That's why this logo here looks like that one, because that's Bitcoin Cash. I think that's a fork of that one, and that one there is a fork of that one, and that one's a fork of that one, and probably some of the others as well. It's more than you can keep track of. So, or you can just go to this website and fill in a form, and it'll create one for you. <laughs> this, is, this is where that store of value thing starts to fall down, right? Because you say, well, we've got this, this digital gold that we're mining, except the mines are infinitely clonable. In, in, anyway. So that's why they, those logos look similar. They're forks of each other. Um, one area where they, they do, uh, so the, these various cryptocurrencies, they, they're often they're forked to, oh, I'm going to have to drink this in a minute because I'll carry it around. So the new, these, these forks are often to try and remedy some perceived flaw in the kind of the predecessor cryptocurrency. So they have different block sizes. You can incorporate different amounts of data into the block or the frequency of the blocks is changed, or the reward structure is different, or the hashing functions are different. But in them, they're all broadly of the shape that I've described. One area where there is work, actually, is in the, um, the block creation mechanism. So what I talked about, this guessing random numbers, is proof of work. And it's, it's hugely wasteful, really, because your, your chance of mining a new block, let's say you're, you know, you're, you're in that basement with that rig there, sweating. You can calculate so many hashes per second. That's your hash power. Your chance of mining a new block is proportional to the total hash power of the whole network. Does that make sense? You know, the whole network can do however many hundreds of thousand, and you can do so many thousand. That's the proportion. And it's hugely wasteful because most of that, that, it's work, but it's useless work because it's only when you get the right number that anything important happens. Most of the time, you just sit in there guessing away and it's, it's, it's wasted. Um, so there are different systems in play, there are different systems being explored that maybe try and mitigate some of that. And one of which is a thing called proof of stake, where your chance of generating a new block is proportional to the amount of money, the amount of currency, not say money, currency that you're prepared to stake on it. You can say, I'm going to pay in, you know, it's, it's kind of escrowed, but I'm going to pay in this much uh, so for the opportunity to create a new block. So then your, your chance of creating that new block becomes proportional to the amount of currency you're prepared to stake. Now that, obviously, then has different potential problems already, and there's a bootstrapping issue, but there's a lot of active work on that. A lot of active work on that. The Ethereum chain is, is looking at doing a lot of work on proof of stake. There's also, and this is used by uh, one or two things, proof of authority, where you just, you say, these nodes, these addresses can create new blocks, and nobody else can. And that's great, actually, because then the power, then the, that hash function can just expand right out, and the power that you, you know, you can run it off your old Amiga in the attic. It's great. But there's, that runs counter to that no central authority thing. 
because you've implicitly got that. And there are kind of combinations of these various things with like lotteries. So you might maybe stake and then you, you're put into a lottery and somehow you get to do it this round and you get to do it in the next round. But they're, they're all variations on a, on a theme. Um, the other major way some of these platforms differ from each other is uh, what can go into a transaction. So one of the consistent, <laughs> consistent themes of this talk so far is me withholding information so I can reveal it to you later. So uh, a Bitcoin transaction is not a little message saying, Alice pays Bob. It's actually a little script. Most of the scripts say pay, but it's a little script. And this is, this is a Bitcoin message. There's some header information at the top there. And it's saying it's got, um, obviously, it's got the hash of the whole thing. We can't go anywhere with that hash in the blockchain world. We've got two inputs. We've got one output. Um, and the inputs are, uh, the outputs are, sorry, the inputs are the, the output of a previous transaction, or two previous transactions in this case, with the hash of such and such. And I'm looking for the, the zeroth output of each case. Uh, and that's the hash of the transaction. And that's the, the hash of the script that I'm expecting that previous transaction to have run. And my output is the, this is what I think the value of my transaction is, which hopefully should be the sum of these two things. And then the output is this hash, sorry, this script, uh, which says something like, I am sending that to the public address which hashes to that value so long as the owner of that public key provides a valid signature. So the transaction mechanism is not, I pay you. The transaction mechanism is, kind of, I pay you. And later, you do another transaction that says, I want the output of that transaction, and I want to use it in this transaction. And this is actually this is an atypical transaction, now I think about it, because quite a lot of, the, uh, of a, like a Bitcoin transaction is, I have 10 Bitcoins, I'm going to send one to you, and then I'm sending nine to myself. And so that's your, the kind of your most recent transaction always has your balance in it. And any difference, it's not... There's, there's that transaction fee I mentioned, there's no explicit place to put that transaction key, but the difference between this and the true value of these two is the transaction fee. It's all hidden away in there somewhere. So we have this little scripting language. Um, it, it's, in Bitcoin's case, it's restricted, it's, it's not Turing complete, and most of the scripts are of this type. I'm not aware that people are doing anything particularly exciting with it. Um, and there are two output, two possible outcomes of this. One is it works, and the other is it doesn't, in which case it just gets discarded. Um, and some blockchain platforms go beyond this kind of simple scripting. I mean, you've probably guessed this is a, like a, that's a duplicate thing. This is a stack-based thing, so we can all relive our fourth days. Um, some of them actually embed proper Turing, proper, they embed Turing complete languages. Um, and probably the best known one of those is uh, Ethereum, which embeds uh, like a, a, a full-on virtual machine. And you can write little functions, what they call smart contracts. Now, naming things is a hard problem, right? We talk about names a lot. I don't know if Peter Hilton's here this year, but he's got a whole 90 minutes just on names. Smart contracts is a deliberately obfuscatory name because they're not smart and they're not contracts. They are programs that you can deploy onto the blockchain. So you send your program out in a, as a transaction, incorporate it into the blockchain, and then later on, other transactions can reference methods on that program. So your transaction is, I want to call the method store on this contract with, this is a very bad example actually because it's got strings in, they're very expensive, uh, with this string and this, you know, this key and this payload. And you can see this is doing some stuff. It's creating a single linked list actually. And then we've got a mechanism here to uh, emit, uh, what do you call them, events. And the Ethereum client, you can tell your Ethereum client to look for these events 
And as it finds them in the blocks, it will send you a little thing that you can then do something, flash up a little do for on your website or whatever it is. So a smart contract is, um, is kind of a way of asking, getting people to do computation on your behalf. And you think, well, that's, isn't that like a one-way trip to denial of service city? Right? All I have to do here is calculate a Mandelbrot set or something, and the whole, the whole thing is going to grind to its knees. So the mechanism to prevent this is, of course, financial. You disincentivize them. So this, is, this looks like JavaScript, right? This is actually a language called uh, Solidity. And it's, you, know, you can see it looks super secure. Um, this compiles down to uh, EVM, Ethereum uh, Virtual Machine opcodes. And each opcode has a cost. So when I want to call this function, what I'm actually saying is, here's my transaction. I want to call this function with these parameters. And I am prepared to pay this much. And if the cost of running that method is equal to or less than the amount of money I'm prepared to spend, the amount of ether in the Ethereum case I'm prepared to spend, then the method runs and is incorporated into the chain. If it's not, it doesn't run, but I lose the money anyway. Okay? And then there are, well, that's fair. Okay, paying you to do my computation is not your fault if my computation is a load of hooey, right? And then there are mechanisms actually within the wider block to limit, there's a, what they call a gas limit. Gas is a, like a fraction of, a, of ether. It's, um, or was it way, I can't remember, is it gas, way, ether, I can't remember what the, it doesn't matter. Um, they have a, what they call a gas limit, which is, there's only so much computation that we can put, we're going to put in one block anyway. And that's kind of dynamically priced. So if the network is very busy, if lots of people are sending in transactions, it actually gets more expensive to run them. So your transaction might not get incorporated. And at, at quiet times, the price goes down. Because we want somebody to like, do computation, right? So we'll make it cheap. I can do it that way. So, and this, this smart contract thing, programs on the blockchain thing is, is one of the things that makes Ethereum more interesting. So anyway, that's what blockchains are. Does that all make reasonable sense? Can't see. Is that all reasonable sense? Cool. Okay. So hopefully you can see how it all, all hangs together. And there are, like I say, there are differences in the peer-to-peer like the -peer protocols and the hash function and the rest, but they're not really important. So, right. Let's all take a Take a moment. Go on. What is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is the first decentralized digital currency. Bitcoins are digital coins you can send through the internet. Compared to other alternatives, Bitcoins have a number of advantages. Bitcoins are transferred directly from person to person via the net without going through a bank or clearinghouse. This means that the fees are much lower. You can use them in every country. Your account cannot be frozen, and there are no prerequisites or arbitrary limits. Let's look at how it works. Several currency exchanges exist where you can buy and sell bitcoins for dollars, euros, and more. Your bitcoins are kept in your digital wallet on your computer or mobile device. Sending bitcoins is as simple as sending an email, and you can purchase anything with bitcoin. The Bitcoin network is secured by individuals called miners. Miners are rewarded newly generated Bitcoins for verifying transactions. After transactions are verified, they are recorded in a transparent public ledger. Bitcoin opens up a whole new platform for innovation. The software is completely open source and anyone can review the code. Bitcoin is changing finance the same way the web changed publishing. When everyone has access to a global market, great ideas flourish. Bitcoins are a great way for businesses to minimize transaction fees. It doesn't cost anything to start accepting them, and it's easy to set up. There are no chargebacks, and you'll get additional business from the Bitcoin economy. For more information about Bitcoin, visit weusecoins.com. How will the internet work in the future? It will use Ethereum. Ethereum is a planetary scale computer powered by blockchain technology.
Applications built on Ethereum run exactly as programmed, without any possibility of downtime, censorship, or third-party interference. Ethereum is the secure backbone for everything from e-commerce to the Internet of Things, enabling transparent governance for communities and businesses while keeping user communication secure. Mix, the Ethereum IDE, makes it easy to develop, debug, and deploy your applications, while building UIs is done using your existing web development skills, tools, and favorite frameworks. Ethereum handles user authentication and secure payments for you, as well as messaging and even decentralized storage. And there's no need to sign up or pay for service to host your applications, as Ethereum is the world's first zero infrastructure platform, allowing your users to regain control over the management of their own funds and personal data. Join the many already developing on Ethereum. Wow. Sounds great, right? Where's my cursor gone? Oh, there it is. So in the, in the first part of this session, we looked at uh, how they, what blockchains are, and now we look at why they're terrible. So we've just seen a couple of adverts for one for Bitcoin. That'll be the one that says Bitcoin's great. One for Ethereum. said so Ethereum's great. Did anything, I don't know, you've only just seen them. I've watched those a million, million times. So terrible. Um, was there anything about the, their purported benefits that, that struck you at all? Simon? Infrastructureless. Infrastructureless, yes. I, I was expecting a laugh, actually, when it said runs exactly as programmed. Because <laughs> that's a hell of a claim, right? Uh, well, y well, yes, indeed. Dom? Bitcoin won this to the whole lot of benefits, but your in-banking to stop people in terror. Exactly. So they talk about uh, a person-to-person, -person, irrevocable, no banks, no limits, no this, no that. And uh, they, they both talk about this idea of, because uh, Ethereum said the same, no censorship. No third-party interference. Like, like those are, there's, a, there's an ideological stall being set out there, right? No chargebacks. No chargebacks, exactly. It's actually true. It's not necessarily good. Well, yes. Now, I'm, over the next few minutes, I am not here to bang the drum for the established economic hegemony, right? But we live in the world we live in. Okay. So, do that. So the advantage that they both gave, an advantage of the cryptocurrency, is that there's no central authority or reversibility, which, as we've, we've just uh, talked about, is fundamentally at odds with modern financial practice. Right? Banks aren't a modern invention. Right? They, you go back to Elizabethan England. It's around that time, isn't it? Just before the, just before the currency crisis, actually. Um, <laughs> Sort of, you know, 15, 1500s, late 1500s, early 1600s, we were in, banks were being developed. And the, and the reason that people used banks is because they were a useful thing. I don't want to have to carry this heavy chest full of gold all the way across the country. Well, I've, I'd be quite nice if you just write that down there and then you handle that, that kind of thing. But then it said, how did it tell you to get hold of Bitcoin? It didn't say, mine your own Bitcoin. How did it tell you to get hold of Bitcoin? Go and buy it. Go and buy the Bitcoin. You go to these exchanges where you, you buy some Bitcoin with your actually useful dollars or euros or yen, right? So you go, hang on, how does that work then? Because you've told me that you're a person-to-person -person thing that, uh, you know, and I shouldn't trust these evil financial institutions. You've implicitly told me that, but you want me to pay with my credit card to get some of these things. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. So either you have to trust them or they have to trust you. The exchange has to trust you. There's an implicit trust relationship there or an implicit credit relationship, which again is one of trust, right? But anyway, so okay, but I'm, I'm keen. I want to do this. I've heard a lot about the Bitcoin economy. Sounds great. I'll get additional business. So I go to an exchange and I buy some, uh, I buy some cryptocurrency. Any, anybody know what's in common with all these things? They've all been hacked. There have been at least 20 
uh, hacks of cryptocurrency exchange, at least 20, and approximately 7% of all Bitcoins in existence have been stolen. It's quite a significant proportion. That's even more than is lost down the back of the sofa, right? One of the most famous in the middle there, Mount Gox, it was hacked uh, twice, actually, once in 2011. That didn't stop people, they still carried on using it. Hacked again in 2014. The purported dollar value of that hack was $460 million. It's quite a lot of money. Presumably, that some people had paid something approaching that to put their money into this thing. Anyone know the, the name, Mount Gox? Magic the Gathering Online Exchange. Started as a website for people to trade their magic cards. Right? And then one day, this fella, Jed McCaleb, he read a slash dot post. About, that's, you know, slash dot's legacy wiped out there. Read a slash dot post about Bitcoin, thought, oh, I'd like to buy some of those. Couldn't. Repurposed his magic trading card site because nobody was using it. And suddenly, found himself in charge of a massive... I don't want to say financial institution because that, that implies a certain level of legal rigor. <laughs> but anyway, um, this one here, this is, this is absolutely fantastic. Quadriga, this is going on at the moment. I had, this is why I've been putting together this talk, because right? so I thought, you know, I should probably do some research. And I had all these kind of incidents and articles and things backed up. And then as every day that I've been writing this, like just news, all the, nearly all the examples you'll see now from like the last fortnight, it's such, so anyway, Quadriga is a, the large was the largest cryptocurrency exchange in Canada, and in this, they have financial services in Canada. Don't laugh. And over Christmas, the founder of this of this uh, cryptocurrency exchange, he, he got married, uh, went on his honeymoon to India, uh, where he died unexpectedly of complications of irritable bowel syndrome. It's only 30, it's very sad. Turned out he was the only person with the passwords to their wallets. So they couldn't, <laughs> they couldn't actually, they couldn't do anything. And then it, it, it subsequently then emerged that they'd been having sort of financial, they'd been having cash flow issues for the previous two years because all the normal banks didn't want to deal with them because they didn't know where this money was coming from. Because like when you give your money to a bank, one of those horrible central banks that's subject to regulation and control, that's still your money, right? And the banks have to account for all the money that they have. It's still your money. These guys, they're just tipping it into a big bucket. Big bucket. So they couldn't, for the funds that they were giving to the like payment processors to send out to people, they, they couldn't account for it. So a lot of them were going, whoa, we don't want to deal with this. And there are stories, actually, people just receiving bricks of cash in the post from these people. So anyway, the cold wallet, it, it, the wallets were offline. They were, you know, not hot wallets. They weren't hacked. Just the passwords were lost because he was basically running this thing, something like $160 million worth of stuff. Every time I give you a dollar value, take that with a pinch of salt, right? But anyway, huge amounts of something, basically running it off his laptop. He dies. Passwords are lost. Turns out the wallets are empty anyway. Somehow, over the previous two years, he and his future wife had bought 16 properties and a plane. And then it looks like India, I, I don't want to be rude about India, but it's quite corrupt. And in the particular state where he died, death certificates are apparently quite cheap. So it all looks very shady. I'm, I know this is going out on the internet. I'm not alleging anything, but it doesn't look good. Um, there was another one, another really good one. This is great, this one. I couldn't find a logo for it because it didn't actually get as far as having a logo. In 2012, there was an exchange called Bitcoinica, and that was run by a 17-year-old teenager. I don't know if any of you have 17-year-old children. I barely trust mine to walk the dog. <laughs> so he was running his, running his cryptocurrency exchange on a, on a Linode virtual host. And again, I'm a Linode customer. I'm very happy with the service I get from them. But I wouldn't be running, you know, a pseudo financial institution from a Linode virtual host. And uh, there was a Linode exploit that was, um, I'm going to say, exploited. Well, I need another word for exploited. Um, used. Uh, and it was hacked three times in 2012. It was hacked in March, and then again in May, 
and then again in July. And the notional dollar values of that first hack were $228,000, small in comparison, and then $80,000, and then, then $300,000. So even though it was being hacked, people were still putting their money in. All right? So, so there's, you know. Anyway, so let's assume, we're going to have to do a lot of assuming in the course of the talk. The, the Bitcoin proponents will say, yeah, but it, it wasn't, that was just the exchanges that were hacked. The ledger was secure, which is, you know that joke about um, Microsoft help, you know, the low-flying plane joke about the answer is correct but unhelpful. It is correct but unhelpful to say the ledger itself was not hacked. Because if you're, you are holding funds at a cryptocurrency exchange and that cryptocurrency exchange was hacked or as is often the case, uh, was stolen by somebody inside the organization, you've still lost your bitcoins or whatever it was. And you can't, and you can't, and you can't reverse the transaction because it's person to person, irreversible. Okay? There's no regulation, there's no insurance. You've lost it. So let's not use these exchanges, and especially let's not use them to store my, my wallet, my, my funds in my wallet. Okay? Let's assume that somehow I've managed to to get some of this wretched stuff. So I'll keep my wallet nice and secure, maybe on my phone. Because your phones are pretty secure, especially if you've got an Apple phone, those are pretty secure. You, you Huawei guys, maybe not. Anyway, this is a OnePlus. I'm, I'm not quite sure which side that falls. Um, so I've got to keep it, uh, but I've still got to use some software to manage my wallet. Oh dear. Um, this, uh, Exchange provided a, an on-device wallet, uh, outfit called BitPay, had a, a wallet called CoPay, that you you know was entirely self-contained on your phone. This was hacked with a compromised NPM package. <laughs> yeah, sorry, somebody just did. They just did an NPM, you know, NCU update. Pulling those. There are, there are, I mean, there are some really brilliant services for keeping your NPM packages up to date. Um, we use one at, uh, at work now. It's great, but we're not, we're not dealing with, you know, this kind of stuff. We're only putting out fires there, actually, actual fires. Anyway, so Bitcoin owners told to transfer savings out, savings, that's an interesting word, out of BitPay wallets after private keys are stolen. So this is essentially like shutting down your bank account and moving to a whole, new, uh, a whole new branch with a whole new account number and everything, which is not necessarily convenient. If we, again, we're going to have to imagine, if in some imagined future, I have, a, I'm, I have some payout pending from a, a smart contract, and my, I can't use this address anymore, I have to create a whole new address, how am I ever going to get hold of those funds that I'm due? This is, this is not, you know, there's a problem, but this, this is the only solution if your wallet is compromised. You can't use that again. And so anything that hinges on that address, that's a, you know, that's a problem. So, and, oh, do keep backups. So, <laughs> so, so this is a fella, this is great. So this is a fella who um, he did actually mine some Bitcoin quite early on, uh, in sort of 2010. And then he, he was decommissioning that laptop, and he thought, oh, I best, best keep hold of that hard drive, popped it in a drawer, and then accidentally threw it away while distracted by family life and a moving house. And when he realized it was somewhere in this landfill outside Newport, also, don't throw your hardware in the bin because it's super toxic, and that's bad practice. Don't do that. So but when he thought about it, later on he thought, oh, hang on, I had some Bitcoins, because, you know, there'd been some kind of price spike, and now he thought they were worth 4 million quid. But anyway, somewhere, somewhere in that landfill. Or if you lose a password, oh, there's no password recovery. That's, he, this fellow can probably afford it. This is one of the guys who runs Boing Boing, he can probably afford it. But, you know, there's a, that's something delicious about that, isn't there? Um, the, these are great. This is from um, 
It's an outfit called uh, Wallet uh, WalletRecovery.info. And uh, this guy will charge, if he can recover your wallet, he will charge you 20% of the contents therein. Person to person, remember, irreversible. So when you generate your wallet, your address, you get, uh, you also, you, obviously you get the address, you have your password that you know, and it will also generate a recovery phrase, like a series of seed words that you can use to like regenerate your wallet, perhaps on another machine. It's important you keep those nice and safe. So this client was typing his recovery words into Notepad so he could print them out, but then he had his Bitcoin stolen because his machine was infected and it was all keylogged. Okay. This fella did manage, all men, did manage to print his seed words out, but because he hadn't set his printer up properly, <laughs> some of the words had fallen off the edge. So you go, okay, maybe, maybe they're just unlucky. Maybe they're just unlucky. Maybe we need a bit more user-centered security. That's a callback. I've been thinking, trying to remember to do that. Anyway, right. So this, this is a good one as well. This is even better. So a customer stored. He got his recovery words on a card. He put it in his jeans pocket. Then he put his jeans in the wash, which, which destroyed the piece of paper with his recovery phrase on. And he only realized months later when updating his wallet firmware. So this is a guy who knew what he was doing. He had a dedicated hardware device, and he still laundered his recovery phrase and his, you know, his funds are lost. Security is hard. Financial security, even harder. And this is by design for this system. Person to person. Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> person to person, irreversible, no censorship. This is by design. So, we're going to have to, we're going to have to, now we're really going to have to, you know, bring the powers of imagination to bear. I've somehow got some cryptocurrency. I've somehow kept it secure. Nobody's taken it off me. I, now I want to spend it, right? Where can I spend it? Uh, we're in Bristol here. It's a busy, prosperous city. Sort of eighth or ninth biggest urban economy in the country. Birmingham is second. Don't let anyone from Manchester say otherwise. <laughs> there are over a million people in this kind of urban area, and there is not one place where you can spend your bitcoins. There is not one. Or if they are, they're not talking about it. Not one. And this is, of course, not a situation not unique to Bristol. To the first approximation, there are zero places accepting bitcoin. Okay? And actually, the minute number that do generally don't accept Bitcoin. They use a service like BitPay. That's the same BitPay, BitPay whose wallet was compromised, and the same BitPay, 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 BitPay whose CEO was fished and had his own wallet emptied. Right? <laughs> and what BitPay does is offer, it's, like a, it's a kind of a, like a PayPal for Bitcoin, right? So you, like a sensible retail outlet, price your goods in your local currency, pounds. And then at the point where some, some lunatic says, I want to pay in Bitcoin, BitPay intercedes here, calculates some Bitcoin price. The Bitcoin is transferred from the buyer to BitPay, who immediately convert it into currency and pass it on to you. So we've gone from one transaction, I pay you, to using a trusted third-party intermediary with at least three transactions, because I probably had to pay real money to buy that Bitcoin in the first place, and now I'm giving it to you for you to convert back into cash and then give it then. So, so, you know, and there are going to be fees at each point, so maybe... <laughs> anyway, but I really, really want a cup of coffee. So I travelled to this place, <laughs> place in Prague, <laughs> where apparently the coffee is very good. And I, like it says, I, you know, I just like the advert, do, 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 press send, and then I wait. And I wait, and I wait. You know, I was talking about that uh, kind of future possibilities, right? How the chain is growing in little strands and gradually the true path through emerges. In order to be certain that my transaction has been incorporated into the chain, I have to wait for it to be, the general rule of thumb is six blocks deep. Bitcoin generates a new block every 10 minutes. 
You can maybe go three blocks, but if you want to be sure, you need to go six. So eventually, I get my cup of coffee. It's, it's cold. It's very cold. Ethereum is uh, one of the advantages of Ethereum is that quicker cycle time. They generate, Ethereum generates a new block about every 15 seconds. But 45 second delay to wait three blocks or you know, 90 seconds to wait six blocks on Ethereum, that's, that's still a significant delay in a retail context, right? You know, you know what it's like. If you don't get your shopping in the bag at Aldi, that's somebody like just charging you with a trolley to get you out of the way. That's, that's still a significant delay. Um, and uh, yeah, Bitcoin has a maximum transaction, maximum throughput of seven transactions per second. Worldwide. Hmm? Worldwide. Worldwide, yes. This is the future of money. Seven <laughs> transactions per second. Um, the, the Bitcoin maximalists will say, well, you shouldn't really compare it to Visa, but I think we really should. Um, <laughs> Visa processes about 150 million transactions a day. And that's, so that's about 17,000 a second. Okay, that's... So anyway, maybe they're prepared to trust me. If I drink it slowly, I'll still be in the shop, you know. So maybe, um, perhaps if I'm, you know, so much for, uh, there's, there's got to be implicit trust here. So much for a trustless system, right? I've got, I've got to trust them. But what if what I'm doing is, is less time critical? Because I'm sure everybody here has either done some work for which they have billed later or has had some work done for which they have paid later. This is an actual business that you can pay, that will accept actual Bitcoins. This is a locksmith in uh, West Sussex. We value the importance of decentralized ledger technologies. They have the power to change a lot of things from financial transactions to unlocking your front door. Bitcoin, smart powered smart locks are a thing. Jesus Christ. <laughs> this, look, this is from February this year. Okay, so this is recent. This is recent. They have been accepting Bitcoin as payment for their locksmithing services for four and a half years. Over four years ago, and at the time of writing, we have not had one customer <laughs> asked to pay in Bitcoin, Dash, or any other cryptocurrency. But they're still very positive. None of our customers have actually paid. We have had lots of interesting, interesting people wanting to discuss the subject in depth. I, I bet you have. I bet you have. Now, this is this. It's, it's uh, anyway. Here's a here's a man from man from Newport again. The the value of Bitcoin has has increased since 2013. Still, look. Is that capita? Is that capita? Do you think? I think that. Anyway. Um, Maybe, maybe Capita operate that landfill and they just felt sorry for him because he couldn't afford a coat. Um, he's, he's thrown away Bitcoins and now apparently worth over $80 million. So he's really keen to get it out of that landfill. He apparently offered the council seven and a half million quid to dig the place up. Okay. So maybe if like, the everyday shoppers are wrong, maybe the store of value people are right. Maybe he really does have 80 million quid's worth just waiting to be mined out of that, that landfill. So if he did that and he recovered that wallet, would he be sitting on $80 million? No, he would not be sitting on $80 million. He'd be sitting on a very large bill from the council and by modern standards, quite a small hard drive. Because um, there is no Bitcoin economy. The, again, look, this is very recent. The exchanges will give you lovely graphs that look like the kind of graphs that are produced by stock exchanges and things showing their trading volumes during the day. And it looks, well, it's clear that the vast majority of that is just nonsense. It's, it's wash trading. They're trading their own, they're not trading it for, for actual money. They're buying Bitcoins with Ether or Litecoin with something else, Tether, I don't know. So they're converting, converting between different cryptocurrencies in order to make it look like there's a lot of stuff going on. Okay? 87% of exchanges report trading volumes that were potentially suspicious. This is not 87% of the volume, it's 87% of the exchanges. 
and 75% of the chains are some form of suspicious activity. Um, the trading volume, we would expect it to equal this much, and it's eight times higher. So, yeah, so they're just moving it between different cryptocurrencies, and, you know, the nice thing about cryptocurrencies is there are so many to choose from. And uh, if you don't like any of them, just wait, there's be more along next year. So, no need for those trusted third parties, no censorship, no third party interference. So let's assume, again, that we have this $80 million. This is, um, this is from less than two weeks ago. Bitcoin price surges 20% as a result of a massive order by a mystery investor. Well, we know they're all mystery investors, right? Massive order, approximately 100, the kind of price, approximately $100 million worth of Bitcoin, which is apparently, a, which is, uh, they wants to buy that much, and that's, that's apparently a massive order. But compared to the alleged market capital of $93 billion, if you do the sums of how many Bitcoin have been issued against what people are alleged to be paying for them, that's tiny, right? That's an insignificant amount. We do, you know, banks do trades like that all the time. And we don't see the pound swinging about like this. If one trade can move the market by 20%, that is an illiquid market. There's nobody actually selling, nobody buying. So I dug up my hard drive and I've recovered my wallet and I've got 80 million pounds worth, 80 million dollars worth, and I try and sell it, the price is going to crash. Still left with my big bill. So, and Bitcoin is, is the biggest cryptocurrency, biggest in terms of sort of public awareness of active users as best we can measure, and so on. But maybe, maybe it's just Bitcoin. Maybe the others are legit, right? <laughs> I didn't know this. When I was looking at this our Welsh friend here, turns out he's gone off Bitcoin now because it's, it's slow, right? He's now into uh, Bitcoin Cash. He's gone off Bitcoin. This is two weeks ago. He's gone off Bitcoin now. He's abandoned his 80 million quid. He's going to... He's now a full-time cryptocurrency investor. He's spending his money on a thing called Bitcoin Cash. Bitcoin Cash is a fork of Bitcoin that's supposed to be quicker and cheaper to mine and all the rest of it. And Bitcoin Cash itself forked uh, a month prior to this into two other forks on, as best I can tell, ideological grounds. One who wanted to put more data in the block and the other that claimed they were staying true to the original vision of Bitcoin, whatever that is. So... Maybe, maybe, some other, maybe some of these other cryptocurrencies are, are, are worth looking at, right? So Elon Musk, we learned yesterday, is, is reckoned by Stack Overflow users to, that they, they reckon he will be the most influential person in technology this year, right? In 2019, Elon Musk is going to set the, set the path that we're all going down, according to Stack Overflow. And... Uh, he, he sent this tweet. This is, what, two weeks ago? Dogecoin rules. Dogecoin is a fork of a fork of a fork of Bitcoin, and it was created as a joke. You all older, older members of the audience will, not the ones as old as the Atari 2600, but the medium age ones, will remember Doge memes, such wow, all that. There's a, that is, I'm not even sure that is a Shibri now, actually. But anyway, there we are. So he posted that. And uh, trading volumes and prices went up 30%. <laughs> this is a rational market. A rational market. Okay. But still, but it's decentralized, right? That must be good for something. You know, all those individual miners, they're keeping that ledger secure for me, right? No. It turns out that if you trust your friends and cooperate with them, it's easier to mine new blocks. So there aren't thousands and thousands of little computers doing this mining. There are big pools of federated computers all cooperating together, because it turns out trust is quite a good thing, right? So there are about 20 on there. So that, when the little video was saying lots and lots of people are securing your edges, it's essentially 20, 20 computers. Right? Some of them have quite a big share. There are things you can do to slow up the network if you have about this much hash power. So there are two quite dominant pools there. Um, 
you know, the estimate, I've, nobody really knows how many actual physical lumps of hardware there are. Uh, I've seen estimates from 5,000 to up to 300,000, which I think is nonsense. But it doesn't matter because they're all pulled together. Most of them pulled together into sort of 20 or so. 75% of which are in China. It's probably this 75%, right? And uh, where are we today? Wednesday. On Monday, China's National Development and Reform Commission listed cryptocurrency mining as an industry it wanted to eliminate. Cryptocurrency mining used to be very, was, was popular in China because it used to have a lot of kind of isolated power stations that weren't sort of very well connected to the national grid. So lo you'd have local areas where electricity was very, very cheap. And as we know, China has been doing a lot of work on its infrastructure, and now they don't have those disconnected power stations. And they'd really rather like to use all those megawatts for useful things like lighting and stuff. So they want to eliminate uh, cryptocurrency mining. And the Bitcoin maximalists say, well, that's a good thing. But I think actually, well, I don't know. If any of these pools, you asked earlier about, could I outpace the, the, the chain? And yes, you can. If this swings round to just over half, you can attack the chain. If we go back to this, I talked about this, this block arriving and being connected to this block, and this block being connected to this block. But this could connect back to anywhere. So I might get a block here that connects back through like an alternative chain that goes way back into the past. But that's now my longest chain. So that's my, tr that's, that's my true blockchain. Suddenly, I've got a longer one that's taking some alternative route. And all the transactions that I waited my six blocks to go through are now invalid. I've drunk my coffee, and now I've rewritten history, and I've got that money back again. Okay. Now this is uh, this is Ethereum Classic, which is the fork of Ethereum. We'll come to why those are the fork of Ethereum. Oh, God, okay, shift on. Sorry. Um, look, look at this. So this was attacked earlier this year with 100 plus block reorganizations. There was an attack on Bitcoin Cash, where their proposed mitigation was to wait 50 blocks for the for transaction confirmation. So not only has my coffee gone cold, it's probably evaporated. <laughs> All right? The, this proof of work stuff is, is not about securing the chain. It's simply trying to outpace the opposition, which is fine if you want to spend approximately 6 million quid a day on electricity. Right? A successful 51% attack allows the blockchain to be rewritten, to spend currency twice, to prevent transactions from happening, just to snarl the whole thing up. And it's happened to several of the smaller cryptocurrencies, and, and there's a website where you can, you can buy that compute power. Uh, this is NiceHash. They, of course, reject the idea that they're using 51% attacks. Um, we believe they're harmful. However, uh, giving everyone with smaller and less secure blockchain projects the option to make them more secure by leasing hash power. If you think your network is under attack, you can mitigate such attacks and further secure the network by using NiceHash. I just like, there's a nice blockchain you have there. Shame if anything happened to it. Um, there's another website called Crypto51, which will tell you the actual dollar value that you would need to spend to outpace various cryptocurrencies and how much of that hash power you can rent from NiceHash. And if we had a whip round, we could afford it. We could do in Dubai coin, for example, <laughs> which is the fuel of Arabian chain and the first mineable digital currency in the Middle East. I don't know, I thought they had oil. Anyway, so cryptocurrencies are not currencies. They are hard to get hold of. They are hard to keep hold of. They are even more difficult to spend. And they're probably going to get lost or stolen or just fade away or jam up. Because if the, pro if the, network, if the popularity of your network starts to fall and miners leave, sort of leave that communal hash pool, it becomes more vulnerable to attack. If those 75% of the current miners in China disappear, Bitcoin, I guarantee you Bitcoin will be attacked probably by renting server space from someone else, right? That stuff about, oh, God. Anyway, so I've, I've gone over time anyway. I, I mean, it's like, there's, 
like I said, I did lots of research. All these things, examples are from recent weeks, and that's even before we get into the ideological nonsense behind it. Because uh, this uh, cryptocurrencies, they come out of that kind of Californian cypherpunk, um, strongly libertarian background. That's why this is this emphasis on person-to-person -person stuff. That's why this is emphasis on no third parties. Um, and I've got, I've got a fucking ton to go. Let's bang through a couple of, because I thought there must be some good here, right? This is, oh, there we go, this is a great one. This is an Ethereum smart contract. This is distributed autonomous organization. This was going to be the future of business. Set of smart contracts, it's a stateless organization, no board of directors, no nothing, just code living around the world. It's like a William Gibson novel come to life, right? So people would buy in and they would get voting rights in this organization and then they would invest in other people's proposals, and then the profits of those would be distributed back through the members of the organization. Launched in April 2016, uh, attracted uh, something like 14% of all issued ether at the time, because it's running on Ethereum, right? It's like, imagine 14% of just pounds disappearing, right? So it was launched on 28th of April, um, by the end of May, it got this huge amount of uh, ether invested, which people have probably paid real money for. And then two weeks later, it was compromised. And um, an attacker gained control of about a third of the funds had been committed. And in that case, the Ethereum developers, who had also bought into this, said, well, you know that thing about the code is always right, no irrevocability. Well, we're not going to do that. We're going to fork the, we're going to rewrite the chain. And they, they rewrote the Ethereum client to recover the funds that had been misappropriated. But if the smart contract software works exactly as written, if the smart contract has done it, is that actually theft? This is a stateless organization operating out with the bounds of the nation, the, the nation state. Is that actually theft? So anyway, the Ethereum developers re rewrote the client to recover the lost funds, and then there was an, an ideological fork in Ethereum because the, kind of the hardcore guys said, no, no, you can't do that. We're going to stay on the, the old system. That's the Ethereum Classic, the one that then got hacked, and the other guys did what they said they wouldn't do and rewrote the chain in anyway. So it's... Um, but there must be some advantage to being able to express things in easy, clear language, right? Who, which party will control the House after the 2018 US midterm election? Uh, there's a thing called Augur, which is one of those um, betting markets. Betting markets are very accurate, generally, right? So there was a market opened on this question. A bazillion people said, it's going to be the Democrats. This market closed on the 12th of October, 2018. The Democrats didn't actually take control of the House until the 3rd of January. So, the correct outcome, according to the smart contract, was Republican. This is why smart contracts are not smart and they're not contracts. Because in any kind of normal setup, if there was a dispute with that, you would litigate that in court, right? And you would say, no, clearly, any reasonable person would see what this question is asking. Augur does have a dispute resolution. You have to pay, you have to stake money to dispute it. And oh, look, the result was declared for the Republicans, contested, declared for the Democrats, contested, declared for the Republicans, contested, declared... I think it stalled. I don't know. $700,000 worth of stuff tied up in that one. Um, but anyway, infrastructureless. No downtime. No third-party interference. Um, it kind of depends what you mean by third-party interference. Okay? This, this is a crypto kitty. Uh, and when it launched in uh, December 2017, it's, like a, it's basically a, a trading card game where you spend actual real money. Well, you spend real money on Pokemon, but you know what I mean. Um, there were so many transactions uh, coming out of... Crypto kitties, because it was really the first kind of consumer type um, Ethereum application um, that legitimate <laughs> Ethereum transactions couldn't get on the chain because there was no room for them in the in the block. Um, it, you imagine like going into your boss. I didn't get that report done on time. I'm afraid there was a, there was a run 
on uh, collectible cats. But anyway, it's going to revolutionize stuff, right? It's going to revolutionize stuff. I'm really, I'm going to wrap up, but this is just too good. Anyway, um, this is a big ship. One of those containers, maybe, I don't know if it's that ship or not, stuff full of mandarin oranges that are traveling from China to Singapore for the Lunar New Year. Mandarin orange is a big thing for the Lunar New Year. And um, IBM collaborated on the bill of lading. Bill of lading is, that piece of, is, is a thing that says what you're shipping, where it's going, who's it for. And uh, uh, IBM claimed that uh, the trial produced a significant reduction in the administrative process, uh, reducing the time taken from five to seven days to less than one second. And you're going, five to seven days to send a bill of lading from one place to another? Don't they have email? <laughs> yeah, they do. They have EDI. They have electronic data interchange, specifically ANSI X12 EDI 211 motor carrier bill of lading, which does this stuff already. The five to seven days is a paper-based system that nobody's used for 30 years. You'd think IBM would know about EDI, what with IBM being a massive player in the EDI space, right? This is it's deceptive at best. Um, the problem with blockchains is that they can only validate things on the chain. Anything that happens off it, you don't know about. This is the Mona Lisa. You might know this story. Uh, Trevor Eden, who's senior at the GDS, I think now at, G at uh, NHSX, said, look, I own the Mona Lisa. That's a photograph you got off of Wikipedia. And these people, Verisart, issued a certificate of authenticity. And uh, Verisart say, well, of course, that isn't the point, because uh, they want to say, look, we're going to cut down on art forgeries and things. Um, they said, that's not the point. This is obviously deliberate fraud. He's lying about this. And Eden said, yeah, yeah, I absolutely am. This is still live on the Verisart website. OK? They can only prove the data that's on the chain. They can't prove stuff off the chain. They can't say that container is actually full of mandarin oranges. Right? You'd have to be drunk to think that. You'd have to be drunk. This is with your blockchain whiskey. I was going to end on a positive note, right, with a little project I've been working on, but I'm just not going to do that now. Um, <laughs> and that's why they're terrible. <laughs> Thank you.